privileged every time I'm allowed to open God's Word and read and preach it. Because I have to recognize that it's not man's Word. It is a holy and yet a very frightening task to proclaim God's Word and to exposit and explain God's Word. Um, especially when I look out and I see the reality that God has intended to choose me for some reason to communicate His truth. So, be certain we're always looking in God's Word. I'm fallible. Be certain we're comparing what I say to the Word of God. And it's my practice to just try to, ex it's called expository preaching, to just explain the text of Scripture, to give proper implications to our lives, and allow the Holy Spirit to use it in our hearts and minds. And so let's look in Romans chapter 4 with that in mind, beginning reading in verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be made sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness." Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. In thinking of a review this morning, kind of bringing us up to speed because this is one of those texts of scripture where we are jumping right in the middle, actually right at the end of one of Paul's thoughts. Chapters 1 through 3 gave us the need of Romans, gave us the need for justification. Remember what justification means. It means being declared not guilty, but being declared righteous in the sight of God. Another way to put it, being right with God. What justification means. Chapters 1 through 3 tell us our need for that, determined by the inspired Holy Scripture, that all have the need of justification. Why? Why? Regardless of class, race, religion, morality, because all are under the bondage of sin. All of us sin. All of us, because we are under the bondage of sin, subsequently all of us serve the master of sin, living in sinful habits and lifestyles. In other words, we all need God's righteousness given because we are completely and utterly unrighteous and depraved in our instincts. And we are all depraved in our actions. We're sinful by birth and sinful by choice. So we are doubly damned as sinners. But in chapter 3, we find the good news, right? Chapters 1 and through 3, the first part of 3, tell us why we need justification. In chapter 3, we get the good news. It is possible, it is possible for unrighteous sinners to be declared righteous by God. It is possible to have this righteousness given to us. It is possible for sinners to be completely forgiven. It is possible for sinners, that's me, to be restored to God's ideal in worship and absolutely justified before God for eternity. In other words, we can have God's righteousness put to our account, reckoning, reckoning us indeed as righteous before Him. This possibility was accomplished, we find in Romans chapter 3, through the sacrificial bloody death of of Jesus Christ, when Jesus, God the Son, willingly gave his life as a substitute for ours. Therefore, as the bearer of man's sin, it became possible for man, the sinner, to bear his righteousness. A transaction takes place. This is called the great justification transaction. So chapters 1 through 3 give us the warning and despair as we writhe under our need for righteousness. But chapter 3 also gives us the hope 
that we see it's possible to not become righteous by our own efforts, but it's possible through God's grace. His righteousness is available to sinners. Chapter 4 then gives us the means for that righteousness. The, the way we can have that righteousness. Chapter 3 says it's possible. God has paid the price necessary. Chapter 4 tells us, well then how do I get that righteousness on me? I want that. I don't want to be guilty. <laughs> how do I get that declared to my account? Chapter 4, which we've been looking at for the last several, for about the last month I believe, shows us the means by which righteousness can be appropriated to our account. And he uses a word that is very important. He uses a, a theological word. It's actually a banking word that is used, has a theological sense to it. He uses this word imputed. Imputation or reckoning. Accounting is all the idea of this word. It's used over and over again in chapter 4. Eight times in just the first few verses. And he uses this example to describe this imputed righteousness, this righteousness that is God's, that is Jesus Christ, that is then put to my account, literally put to my account. Not just God says, well, I guess I'll, co I'll consider them to be righteous. No, he actually says, no, you are righteous in my sight. And then he begins us in this process of making us righteous called sanctification. This... Imputed, imputed righteousness is evidence that it only comes by faith when he talks about this person Abraham. Which is what chapter 4 is about. It's the example of Abraham being one who received God's righteousness, who righteousness was imputed to his account because of faith, not because of the works he did. And if you remember, one of the most important aspects he says about that, we looked at last week, was the reality that when did Abraham receive this righteousness? When did he receive it? He received this righteousness, according to Genesis 15, and what Paul quotes here in Romans, when he was still a Gentile. He received this righteousness before he ever was circumcised, before the law was ever given, before he ever had a chance to keep the law, before he ever had a chance to prove his morality. He received God's righteousness because it says in Romans chapter 4, verse 1, for what saith the, verse 3, sorry, for what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. When did he receive the righteousness of God? When he believed God. In Genesis chapter 15 is what that's a quote from. Romans chapter 4 verses 10 through 15, which we looked at last week, or 9 through 15 actually, which we looked at last week, shows us that it is... Through the grace of God, by faith in Jesus Christ alone, that one is declared righteous before God. Religious observance like circumcision had no place in, righteous, in, in the righteousness of Abraham, in his imputed righteousness. The law, the keeping of the law, had no place in the imputed righteousness of Abraham. And I love that because it just is, is as I said last week, it's like that nail in the coffin. Paul is saying, deal with that. <laughs> He's saying, okay, what are you going to do with this? Oh, Jewish man who says you must be circumcised. Your father was righteous before he ever was circumcised. He was imputed righteousness to him. And then he pointed out at the end of verse 15, it also is not by law, it's not by morality, not by keeping of God's laws that we are declared righteous because the law brings wrath. The law brings the knowledge that we can't keep the law and therefore the knowledge that we are under God's wrath. Case is closed. Justification is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, revealed in the scripture alone, for the glory and honor of God alone. And so in conclusion to the discussion of justification by faith alone, that's where we're at today, that a conclusion of the discussion, Paul, being carried along by the Holy Spirit in writing this, being the very thoughts, the very words of God, says that we too can have the same justification of Abraham. And remember what the reason is, the condition is, the method is. He says there, if we walk in the steps, verse 12, if we walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. So, verses 16 through 25, describe for us the steps of the faith of Abraham. Describes for us Abraham's faith. So, if we walk in the same steps of the faith of Abraham, we too have this justification. So then the obvious question is, okay, 
How did Abraham believe? What was that all about? Describe for me Abraham's faith. And so Paul says, okay, I'll describe Abraham's faith in verses 16 through 25. And that's where we pick up our study. By the way, chapter 5 will go on. He doesn't talk about justification by faith alone in chapter 5. He talks about the results of justification by faith alone. The blessings, the reward, the, the re reality that we are from, freed from God's wrath and that we are free from the penalty of sin, that all comes after he describes the faith that brings about those results. So in chapter 4, as the passage we read, we need to understand that you will have peace with God, according to chapter 5, verse 1. You will have peace with God and be at peace concerning the eternity of your soul. You will be a new creation Created unto good works, not created by good works. And Paul describes this reality, this possibility of each one by following in the footsteps of the faith of Abraham or those, we might say, who practice the same kind of faith Abraham had. So, let's dive into this. Let's dive into this text. Before we, before we look at the explanation of the text, that a thought occurred to me when I was studying this that sometimes, it wasn't a random thought, by the way. It was a thought based on some experiences I've had. That sometimes we struggle with this idea of faith. Don't we? What is faith? What does it mean to believe? In fact, I've had people tell me, I can't believe. I just, I just don't have this kind of faith. I can't. And I say, yeah, you're right. <laughs> None of us can unless God gives it to us. None of us can believe without God's Holy Spirit drawing us to himself. But some might say, and maybe you are crying out deep within you, I just can't believe my faith is so weak. I want to encourage you this morning to rest upon the promise of God of Romans chapter 3 and chapter 4, namely, that if you will call upon the Lord Jesus in faith, you will be justified. Rest upon that promise. Faith is resting. I want to encourage your heart to flee doubt and rest wholly in the Son of God. Yes, there is much you are uncertain about, but cry with the sinner recorded for us in Matthew 9.20, whose child was demon-possessed, and Jesus said, If you believe, all things are possible. To which he cried, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. You may be here this morning, you say, I just, my faith is so weak. So was his. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help where I don't believe. Where Jesus told the disciples, faith the size of a grain of mustard seed can do the impossible. And remember what Jesus emphasized to them, O ye of little faith. And yet, he never gave up on them, did he? He never condemned them for their little faith. He continued to show himself to them. They continued to understand. And they were able to cast their care, their dependence on him, their rest in him. I know you might feel you have little weak faith because I feel that every day. <laughs> we're going to look at this morning. It's not the strength of our faith that determines our justification. We'll find that in the text here. But I want to encourage you this morning, just have an open heart. If you say, my faith is too weak, have an open heart to what God has to say here. Maybe there's another individual here who has come along. They've been with us in Romans. They've heard the words of Romans. They believe the scripture, but their faith is weak and they've yet to cross that line from mental agreement to complete trust in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. They are considering turning away from the Lord Jesus Christ. They're being drawn back from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ toward materials or family or religion. I want to say to you this morning, don't go back now. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Be encouraged from this text this morning we're going to look at that though at times your faith might be maybe weaker than at other times, God has promised that you will be justified, redeemed, glorified, and He cannot go back on His word. Ask Him to grow your faith in His dear Son. God will endue you with greater faith as you meditate upon His word. Well, it's kind of unusual for me to give the application before the exposition, but... I want us to consider these things before we look in this text. I want you to consider where you are this morning as we analyze and contemplate this majestic text of Abraham's faith. So, let's look in God's perfect word. First thing I notice in verse 16 is the divine purpose for faith. 
the divine purpose for faith. Notice, this is a continuation of what he has already said, that faith is imputed, I mean, that righteousness is imputed to a sinner's account through faith alone, right? We've We've accomplished that in Romans 1 through 4, verse 15. <laughs> okay? So we're not going to go back and rehash that again. But the first word in verse 16,